Good morning. Good morning. If you'd grab your bulletin and tear off that next step card and then fill that out sometime uh, between now and the end of the service and place that in the offering basket. <clears throat> we'd love to get to know you better and uh, give you any information you need about our church. Uh, we'd also like to pray for you, so if you have a, a prayer request, just let us know. And uh, we're doing baptisms today at the end of the service, so, uh, so this will actually be a shorter message. Some of you are like, phew, that's good. <clears throat> you know, baptism is really a, a visual demonstration of an inner reality. Uh, it's like when I stood on the altar and said, I promise I will love you forever to my wife. Um, it's an it's inner promise and a commitment and a love between us. But I wear this ring as kind of a symbol, as a, a demonstration of that inner reality. And so when people come to get baptized later, they're basically saying this is a public profession. It's a demonstration of an inner life transformation that's happening inside. So, uh, so we're excited to... Uh, to celebrate baptism today. We did six at the early service, and then I think we're going to do six this service too. And if you want more information about baptism, you can let us know on your next step card or you can go on our website at uh, blueoaks.cc backslash baptism, and you can find out a lot there too. All right, uh, we're studying the stories of Christ, uh, these stories that really do stick with us. And uh, I'm going to just get right into it today. Today we're going to Look at a story of the workers in the vineyard in Matthew 20, starting in verse 1. If you want to follow along, if you have your Bible, we'll read Matthew 20, uh, verses 1 to 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About the third hour, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing, he told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. About the eleventh hour, he went out and found still others standing around. He said to them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about the eleventh hour came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, Friend, I'm not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who is hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have a right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? And so the last will be first and the first will be last. All right, so here's a man who owns a vineyard. Uh, and it's probably harvest time and so he needs workers. Uh, this is a common practice in uh, Jesus' day. Uh, he goes to the marketplace where people would gather around if they needed work. Uh, they would be standing around with their tools if they had tools, and they would be hoping to get hired for the day. Uh, it was their hope for work to support themselves and to support their families. And here we need to understand, by way of background, a vineyard was a common metaphor in the Old Testament for the people of Israel. Uh, there's an example of this in Isaiah 5, Isaiah 5, verse 7. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel. Uh, the same metaphor is used in Jeremiah 12 and other places in Scripture. And so Jesus' listeners would have understood this is a story about the people of God. Uh, they would have understood the background. This is a story about who belongs to the people of God and who doesn't belong to the people of God. It's just, that's what the vineyard represents. Now, the owner of the vineyard goes to the first group, and he says in verse 2, he agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. So they know up front what they're going to get. Uh, it's a contractual deal. They're going to work a certain amount, and they're going to earn a certain wage. Uh, something else we need to understand is how long a workday was back then. Does anyone know how long a workday was back then? 
It was 12 hours. Uh, it started at 6 in the morning and went until 6 at night. Uh, there were no eight-hour work days. Uh, they didn't have good grape picker unions back then. And so they would have started work at 6 in the morning. And then in verse 3, it says, about the third hour, which would have been at 9 o'clock, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. And so they went. And then he went again about the sixth hour, which would have been around noon, and then the ninth hour, which would have been 3 in the afternoon, and he did, he did the same thing. And I just want you to notice something. There's a detail in this story that's significant. Uh, the first group, it says in verse 2, had an agreement. Right? The first group, they knew exactly how much they were going to receive. According to Jesus, they were on the wage plan. But the other groups had a different kind of relationship. Notice verse 4. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. How much is that? They didn't know. Let me see a show of hands on this one. How many of you would work under those conditions? Like, how many of you would say, you know, I agree to give so many hours per week and perform certain tasks, and then in the contract under the salary category, it just reads, whatever my employer thinks is right. How many of you would work under those conditions? To work under those conditions, you would have to have a high degree of trust in the one who's paying you. You're banking everything on his generosity, and that's what these workers did. They said, we'll sign on on the basis of trust. And so the master goes back to the marketplace over and over again throughout the day. Verse 6, now it's 5 o'clock, one hour till quitting time. One hour and the day is gone. He sees guys still hanging out in the marketplace and he says, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us. Duh. It's kind of an obvious thing, isn't it? And the real question is, why are these guys even bothering to hang out in the marketplace around this time of the day? Now, you have to understand, these are not Harvard MBAs. I mean, this is, this is unskilled labor. This is just like one step up from begging. These guys are not very smart hanging around the marketplace with only one hour left in the day. Like, who's going to hire them with one hour left to work? It's like trying to get a job selling Christmas trees on Christmas Eve. I mean, you'd have to be crazy or desperate or stubborn or hopeful or maybe a little bit of each. You know, imagine their surprise when the owner of the vineyard comes and offers them a chance to work. They think, well, at least we'll get an hour's worth of work in. At least the whole day wasn't a waste. And he says, I'll pay you what's right. And they probably think, you know, it's going to be some prorated version of what he's going to pay the all-day workers, like a one-twelfth of a denarius or something like that. That's what you would expect. That's what they would, uh, that was what would make sense for those who worked one hour instead of twelve. And so that's the first half of this story. And then in verse 8, we go on to the second half. And evening comes, now it's pay time. And this is where the story really kind of takes a turn. Uh, if the owner's hiring practices are unusual, they're nothing compared to his compensation policy. Uh, the whole human resources department in this vineyard are highly unusual. Uh, when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired, and then going on to the first. Normally, you'd pay the earlier workers first. That was just the, the normal way they would do it. So the all-day workers would come in, and they would get their money first, and then they would leave, and then the next guys would come in, and they would get paid, and then they would leave, and so on. Uh, but Jesus shifts this precisely because he wants us to see the response of the guys who worked all day long. And we'll see why. Verse 9. The workers who were hired about the 11th hour came, and each received a denarius. And so the owner here starts with those who worked for just an hour, but he pays them a full day's wage. They get 12 times what they deserve. And you have to understand what this would mean for them. I mean, it would mean that they would have enough money to feed their families. It would mean that they would live another day. You have to picture their response as they're walking home together, as they're leaving the vineyard. They're probably saying to each other, he said, I'll pay you what's right. I never dreamed it would be like this. I wonder if someone in payroll messed up, you know, let's get out of here before he finds out what happened, changed his mind or something. And this scene gets repeated. All the part-timers get full-time pay. And then comes the all-day workers, verse 10. So when those... So when those came who were hired first, 
they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. They get only what is contracted to them. And they've been watching this amazing generosity go on, but their response is not, you know, what an amazingly generous owner you are, owner of the vineyard. You know, it's, it's so amazing. You've done a great thing for these other people. No, they grumble. Verse 11, when they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only an hour, they said, and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, friend, I'm not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who is hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have a right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? All right, so that's the story. Now the question is, why is Jesus telling the story? Like, what is he after here? And first of all, we need to get real clear on the focus of this story, which is something that we have to do with all of the stories that Jesus tells. Uh, This is not a story about how corporations should draft compensation policies. As a general rule, people who do a a task for 12 hours should get paid more than people who do that same task for an hour. So it's not a story about drafting compensation policy. The context for this story is the offer to live in the kingdom of God has now come through Jesus Christ. Jesus himself lives in the care, the constant care and the constant protection and the favor of God. And then he says, so can we. Who can? Like who's eligible? Who gets to be a child of God? Who gets to go to the vineyard? Who gets to live in the care and protection of God? Jesus says, anyone and everyone. All kinds of sinful people are flocking to Jesus, the prostitutes and the corrupt tax collectors. And the lowest of the low in that culture, the the Gentiles and the Samaritans, like the, the lowest of the low of the human race, they're first trickling and then they're flooding to Jesus. And Jesus welcomes them in. And he says, you can walk right into the kingdom of God. They get the whole denarius. They're not made assistant disciples They don't have to start off on the JV team. It's like they move right onto the varsity squad. But there are religious leaders. There are scribes and Pharisees, guys that have been in the vineyard all day long. They're not too happy with us. They resent God, and they resent grace. I'm going to tell you the truth. I think they resent their lives. And so Jesus tells the story, which is really about two kinds of people. And the reality is each one of us in this room are on our way to becoming one of these two kinds of people. That's why this story is so important for us. On the one hand, we have what might be called performance-based Christianity. These are people who live as if God, as if like they're in kind of a wage-earning relationship with God. <clears throat> this often happens to people who have been in the church or the vineyard for a long time. For many of us, because we avoid certain disgraceful sins, we can start to think that really God's getting a pretty good deal in me. And we miss out on grace. Over time, we become like the people in Jesus' story marked by a grumbling spirit or a judgmental spirit or a resentful spirit. Right in the church, in the vineyard, we can live out a kind of performance-based Christianity. Or we can live a grace-based Christianity. The second group that Jesus talks about, uh, they don't have a contract. They represent the sinners and the tax collectors and the prostitutes. They're just like flocking to Jesus. They're the latecomers. They're desperate, and they know it. Their whole relationship with God is based solely on trust. They're banking everything they have on the generous character of the owner of the vineyard, and they get grace, and they're completely amazed by it. They're overwhelmed with gratitude. They're humbled because God is so good to them. They're motivated to grow and to work in the vineyard out of sheer gratitude for what God has done for them. That's grace-based Christianity. Performance-based Christianity is Christianity without grace, and it's deadly. And so what I want to do in the moments that we have left is look at two characteristics of this performance-based Christianity, and then I want to talk about how we can fight against it. How can we live as grace-based Christians, as people who are not only saved by grace, not only assured forgiveness in heaven because of grace, but who live in grace, who just live in it? I want to talk about two characteristic attitudes or spirits of this 
performance-based Christianity, and then I want to look at how we can combat each one, what the antidote to each one is. And the first mark of performance-based Christianity is what might be called a resentful spirit. <clears throat> that is experiencing God as a strict taskmaster rather than a loving father. And if this is you, you find that God's sense of affirmation or pleasure is always associated with something that you do. You feel like a dutiful soldier or a faithful servant, but not a deeply loved child of God. You find it hard to believe that God loves you when you're not doing something, that God just loves you, period. You find that you may be involved in a lot of activities, spiritual practices and all that, but you're not led into places and experiences where your soul is being restored and you're being filled up. In Jesus' story, these people come to resent God's grace. Look at verse 15. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? And then Jesus says these next words that are like a dagger to the heart. He says, or are you envious because I'm generous? Literally, that phrase could be translated, or is your eye wicked? Has your eye gone bad? Envy is a sin of the eyes. You know, in the Old Testament, when Saul became jealous of David because of David's popularity, the writer of Scripture says, so Saul eyed David from that point on. Envy grows in people in the vineyard. It's why Cain killed Abel, because he was jealous that Abel's sacrifice to God was better than his. Matthew tells us it's why the chief priest handed Jesus over to be killed because of envy. Envy grows, and these people that have been in the vineyard all day long discover that they would prefer that the master not be generous at all. They would have been happier if the latecomers got nothing at all. And when this happens in your spirit or in mine, and it does, we find ourselves jealous of people whose lives are successful and thriving. We play little games like if they're accomplishing more, then we convince ourselves that we're more spiritual or we're more emotionally healthy. Or if they're more spiritual or emotionally healthy, then we convince ourselves that we're accomplishing more. Or if they're accomplishing more and they're healthier, we just don't like them. <laughs> and then we try to rationalize why. It's a resentful spirit. And there's an antidote to this one. And I want to ask you to do something this week. I want to invite you to take some time out of your schedule this week to just receive and reflect on God's love for you. Will you set aside time this week just to receive and reflect on and experience yourself as one who is loved by God? You know, for most of us, this experience doesn't come automatically. And so I'd like to invite you this week, go to some place that you love. Maybe it's your favorite room. Maybe it's a place outdoors. Maybe it's on a hike somewhere in this area. Maybe it's to the beach. Maybe it's to a park. Go someplace that you love and go there during the best time of the day. The best time of the day, whatever that time is for you. Maybe it's in the morning. Maybe it's in the afternoon. Maybe it's in the evening. And I want you to take this verse with you. Take 1 John 3, verse 1. And will you write that down so that you don't forget it? 1 John 3, 1, where John says, See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. I want you to take that verse and just personalize it. Put your name in it like this. See what love the Father has given Matt Van Cleve, that I should be called a child of God, because that is what I am. Now, if that's true, and I'm staking my eternity on it, and so are you, I mean, if that's true, what can hurt you? What can destroy you? Go somewhere this week and just set aside time, the best time of the day, and just live with that statement. Just live with it. Ask God to say those words to you. Ask God for the gift of feeling those words and knowing those words to be true in your life. Ask for the gift of tears. Ask God to engage with you emotionally. Let your mind dwell on this great truth. Just live with it until you know it in your heart and your mind and your soul to be true. And please don't just hear what I'm saying right now and just walk away and miss this. Take time to receive and experience God's love for you. No one can do this for you. And by the way, this is, some, this is not something that we can do in a corporate setting. This is something that we have to do alone with God. Don't let yourself be destroyed by a resentful spirit. 
All right, the second mark of performance-based Christianity is a judgmental spirit. And we see this in Jesus' story as well in verse 12. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. There's this spirit of uh, superiority here. I'm working harder than other people. I'm sacrificing more. I'm doing all the work around here. This happens in the church as well. You know, sometimes people who are serving in the church will develop a sense of martyrdom. Of course, they won't just come right out and tell someone, you know, they're a martyr. Uh, they'll strategically drop hints to make sure people know how much they're doing. This is the way martyrdom works. People with performance-based Christianity live as perpetual martyrs, and they serve with a resentful spirit. I remember reading something a while back about spiritual maturity. as a brilliant statement. One of the great signs of maturity are the thoughts that no longer occur to you. One of the great signs of maturity are the thoughts that no longer occur to you. And when you first begin to serve, if you've never actually done it before, it's just inevitable that you'll be filled with thoughts of, you know, what an amazingly wonderful thing that I'm doing. You know, what a noble person I'm becoming. Why are not people applauding, you know, for this? You know, why do they not see how amazing this is? And as we grow in servanthood, and I know this mostly from people who have grown a lot more than I have in this, what people discover is that it really is a better way to live. Somewhere along the line, you discover that Jesus really knew what he was talking about, that it truly is better to give than to receive. Those are not just words. It's not just like a tricky way to get people to do what's right. It's actually better to give than to receive. And the person who firmly believes that finds that the thoughts that used to occur to them at the beginning just no longer occur to them anymore. Their right hand doesn't know what their left hand is doing. And Jesus is just so wise about this. Think about it. When we begin to fight sin, the first day that you fight a sin that you've never fought before, it takes an enormous amount of energy. And you're just thinking the whole day, what an amazing thing that I'm doing resisting this temptation. And as you mature, eventually that just doesn't have a hold on you anymore. One of the signs that we're growing like Jesus are the thoughts that just stop occurring to us anymore. And we just begin to live the way that Jesus would live if he was in our place, just freely and authentically. But sometimes we serve with a resentful spirit. And sometimes we're even aware of it. You know, I'm serving with the wrong spirit for the wrong reasons. And we become aware of this, and then we say, well, I just need to stop serving them. Does it sound like a good idea? It's not a good idea. It's like saying, I've been eating for all the wrong reasons. I'm just going to stop eating. It's not a good idea. What we need is a change of heart. We need to start serving for the right reasons because authentic servanthood should produce in us joy. Serving when it's done right really will produce inside of us a sense of deep fulfillment and satisfaction. And so if you find there's a spirit of judgmentalism or martyrdom, then it may be that something has gone wrong with serving for you. Maybe you've been serving outside of your area of giftedness, and so you need to identify and serve in an area where you're actually gifted. Maybe you've just been doing the same thing for way too long. That happens. Maybe you need to explore serving in new ways, uh, try out new areas of ministry to breathe fresh life into you. Maybe you just need to ask God for new joy in serving. Maybe, consider this, maybe you need to receive an act of service. You need to be served. Because in Christian community, we need to serve, but we also need to be served. We don't talk about this a whole lot. Uh, this is really interesting. I was thinking about this this week, about Jesus serving his disciples. When he put a towel over his arm and he served them, uh, in the upper room, Jesus knew his disciples were not serving right. They didn't have the right heart about servanthood. And his first step in forming them was not to have them serve. His first step was to have them be served. He wanted them to experience what it was like to be served by him. One of his disciples, Peter, said no. He didn't want Jesus to serve him. But Jesus knew that when they experienced his servanthood, it would mark them and they would see and experience this wonder of servanthood and that would change them. And they would serve from the inside out. Maybe this week you need to receive an act of service from someone. Maybe someone will offer you 
to do a favor or give you something. And what happens usually for you is you tend to say no because you don't want to feel indebted to them. But maybe you need to say yes. You need to be reminded of the sheer wonder of servanthood by being served. And then you'll want to serve again. If you're married, maybe you'll need to get a little bell so your spouse can know when you need service. I know where you can get one unused. (laughs) Let me close by saying a word about the ultimate act of serving because the ultimate act of serving comes out of this parable as well. Uh, It's when we extend God's grace to other people. One of the genius points of Jesus' stories and we'll see this in other stories as well, is that we tend to identify with different characters in his stories. A lot of times the explosive power of these stories comes as you discover who you identify with. This is very interesting. Philip Yancey wrote this about this parable. Significantly, many Christians who study this parable identify with the employees who put in a full day's work rather than the add-ons at the end of the day. We like to think of ourselves as responsible workers, and the employer's strange behavior baffles us as it did the original hearers. We risk missing the point of the story, that God dispenses gifts, not wages. None of us get paid according to merit like these early workers, none of us, for none of us come close to satisfying God's requirement for a perfect life. If paid on the basis of merit, we would all end up in hell. And here's the truth about every one of us in this room. We are all the latecomers. Every one of us. Even those who have gone to church since nursery days, we're all the latecomers. We're all the lucky ones. We're the ones receiving what we don't deserve. We're the ones getting gifts and receiving mercy where we should receive judgment. I am the lucky one. I am self-righteous and judgmental and unloving, and I've gossiped and I've lied and I've lusted and I've broken all of God's commandments with my hands or at least in my heart. I deserve punishment at the hands of a holy and just God. And instead, I'm given life and friends and a church, community, spiritual gifts, the opportunity to teach the presence of God in my life, the promise of life to all all its fullness here in this life, and eventually eternal life with God when I die. Don't make any mistake about this. We are all the latecomers. You are the latecomers. No matter how long you've been a Christian or how much you serve, you are the latecomers, you and me. We're all getting grace. And the ultimate sign of receiving grace is extending it to someone else. Finding someone else that we can get to the vineyard. No matter how late in the day, no matter how long they've been standing around, because you just never know. You know, I've been recently getting to know a woman in her late 60s who started coming to Blue Oaks just a couple months ago. Uh, She grew up Catholic and essentially closed the door on God uh, after her son died about 20 years ago. And she said to me this week, she said, God is opening my eyes like he has never opened my eyes before. She's just overwhelmed with God's love and God's grace. She said, these last two months have been completely life-changing for me. And here's what's so beautiful about the story See, this story ultimately isn't really about the whiny all-day workers. This story isn't really mainly about the latecomers, the lucky latecomers. You know what this story is really about? The really remarkable character in this story is the master of the vineyard. It's his story because he keeps just going back to the marketplace. The master of the vineyard goes back over and over and over again. He goes back at the 11th hour He's going to get hardly any benefit from it at all. He's going to lose a full day's wage. Like all the other workers would have laughed at him. All the other owners of the vineyards would have laughed at him. You know, keep that up and you'll go broke, they'd say. It'll cost you everything you have. And they'd be right because it did cost him everything he had. But the master of the vineyard just can't stop hoping. Maybe I'll find just one more, he says to himself. Maybe there will be one more human being all alone, no prospects, no hope, thinks he'll never be a part of anything, thinks he'll never be a part of community, never contribute to anything, and maybe, just maybe, he'll be desperate enough or hopeful enough or brave enough to trust me. And if he does, I'll bring him in and I'll give him a place in my vineyard and when payday comes around, I'll give him the full measure of my grace and I can't wait to see the look on his face when I do it. You know, the clock is running out. 
and any reasonable vineyard owner would have gone home a long time ago, and still he comes, just like hoping and waiting for one more. And the question for us is, who will help him search? And the answer is you and me. You know, as long as I am the teaching pastor of this church, Blue Oaks will be a place that is open. We will be a place like the master's vineyard. God forbid we ever become a a community of performance-based Christianity. We need to be a community that is overwhelmed and amazed and humbled by God's grace. We need to keep noticing grace and keep basking in God's love and keep serving in God's vineyard. We need to keep going back to the marketplace, hoping to find just one more. Amen? (laughs) All right, let's pray as the ushers come forward to receive the offering and the band comes to lead us in one more song. God, we're so grateful for this, this story that's in your word that is just such a powerful story. It's a powerful reminder of your kingdom that you've come to bring here on this earth that is open and available to anyone and everyone, no matter where we've been, no matter what we've done. And God, we are just overwhelmed sometimes by your love and your grace and your mercy. And God, if we're not, I pray that you would reignite that fire in us. God, help us to to realize the price that you paid to free us from sin and from guilt and from the consequences of that. Help us to be overwhelmed by your amazing grace. God, we love you so much. We're so grateful for how much you love us back. God, we just commit this time as we sing this song. I pray that it would truly be a reflection of our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name.